Hello and welcome back to implementing Henley Milner in TypeScript. So in the previous video, we set up some things. Uh, we set up a TypeScript project where we've got some helper functions. So for example, dealing with substitutions, uh, applying them, combining them, um, dealing with instantiation and generalization of types, uh, as well as figuring out how to unify types. Um, we then also you know, had some models, so of the actual expressions that we're going to be inferring from and the uh, types. Uh, and then we also built a parser so that we can kind of give it a string uh, that represents uh, whatever we're, we're using um, and then uh, interpret that as the expressions. In this video, we're going to look at implementing algorithm W. So uh, this is the slide I had uh, from previous videos, uh, which you know was taken uh, from a paper, um, linked down uh, in the description for the reference. Uh, but this is uh, algorithm W. Um, and so we have definition here. We've built all the helpers. And so now we should be able to implement it. Uh, so let's uh, jump right in. We've also looked at a previous video uh, at Kind of how to read this, I guess. So if you haven't seen that, that might be useful in understanding how I'm going from this algorithm to the TypeScript. Uh, but hopefully, uh, it should be fairly straightforward. So um, we'll create a new function uh, called W for algorithm W, uh, and so we can see it takes a typing environment and an expression, and then returns a substitution and a type. So let's give it that type signature. Um, so it has a typing env, uh, which we call context. Um, I guess we could call this context as well within here, but uh, I'll just call it that for now. Um, an expression, uh, which is going to be a type expression, uh, and that's going to return a substitution and a type. And when it says type, uh, really what that means is monotype. Cool. Uh, and so we can do that. So we've got W has a context and expression and returns a substitution and monotype. And then we've got these four different cases. So as I said, when we were building the helper uh, functions, uh, what algorithm W is basically going to look like is doing pattern matching on the kind of uh, types of these expressions and then executing whatever the thing on, on the right is. Um, and so we can do that pretty easily. Uh, so the first one is, I guess, just X. So if it's a variable expression, so you can do if our expression uh, type is var, uh, then we need to do this thing. Well, what we're doing is basically this is our kind of... You know, conditions, and then this is what we're returning. So we're going to return uh, ID, which is like the identity substitution or the empty substitution. Uh, and then we're also going to uh, return whatever the thing is in the context uh, with that is now instantiated with these new type variables uh, in a vector uh, beta. And so the first thing is we can deal with this where condition. So where x from the context is equal to this thing. Uh, so we're going to say, you know, let's, let's pull it from the context and we can say like a value is type end, which is our from our context, um, and then the variable name, which is going to be, I think, extra x, right? Uh, so putting x and pulling it out of the context, which is this type end thing. Um, cool. And so we've got this value. Uh, there is an edge case here, which is if you use a variable that isn't defined, you're going to get like an undefined va value. Uh, so we'll need to check for that. So if this uh, value like is... Uh, undefined, uh, then we'll, we'll throw an error saying that, uh, like, hey, uh, undefined variable, and we can give the name here as well. I would say, I think it's be expert.x, and then make this a template string, uh, so that gets substituted in. Um, and then otherwise, you can just return uh, the thing, right? So which is the pair of the identity solution, which is uh, if we make a substitution, just empty, um, and this type, but instantiated. So if we instantiate um, value. There we go. That one's done. So that's our var uh, expression done. Uh, for our function abstraction, let's do this one. So the type is abs. Um, well, we've got two things. So first we need to recursively call algorithm w uh, with the context plus this extra assignment x colon b um, on the kind of body expression e, um, creating a new type variable b. Um, and then store that as a substitution uh, s1 and t1. So let's, let's do that. So let's say we have, um, I think we're going to have to remember this new beta. So we'll first have uh, beta is just going to be a new type variable, right? That's what this new new beta means. Um, and then we can have s1 and tau1 is going to be equal to calling w on our context, right? So the same context. Uh, but in this case, we want to add this x beta. So we'll make a new context based off that context uh, where we're going to spread out our type, our existing type environment. So that's the same as this context here, plus this extra assignment x uh, to beta. So that would be 
expert.x uh, maps to beta. Cool, that looks good. Um, so that's our context done. And then the other thing we need to pass in is the expression e. So that would be the expert.e, right? And then the next step is we just return this one. So we return substitution s1, and then we return the type s1 applied to. And then here we've got a function from beta to tau1. Uh, so this is going to be a type function application of uh, the function type function. Um, and the arguments are going to be beta and tau1. Cool. Um, and hopefully the syntax is making sense. If not, maybe go back look go back and watch the previous video on our helper functions and hopefully like the make context stuff and applying these substitutions uh, and defining our, our types like this uh, will make more sense. Cool. So that's our abstraction rule done. Uh, next, we've got our rule for uh, application. And an application, uh, we've got first one is just uh, S1 and Tau1 uh, are going to be equal to calling uh, W on our type environment and then E1. So expression E1. Then we have S2 and Tau2. And we want to combine the typing constraints that we learned when we called this the first time. So we're going to apply the first substitution, this S1, to our typing environment. So we make sure we combine these constraints, uh, including them in the type environment. Uh, and we have E2. Um, uh, there you go. And then S3 is going to be our substitution that happens when we try and unify uh, these, these two types. Uh, well, not quite these two types, uh, but types that we can construct using uh, this kind of rule where we have a tau2 to beta uh, and just tau1, uh, what those should be together. So uh, we then apply s2 to tau1, so that we make sure that any constraints picked up here, right in the second line, get also applied back to this, right? Whereas this one already contains the constraints from, from both of them because we had the s1 constraints included there and also we just generated s2. So we're going to unify that. Um, and then also similarly here, we're going to have this kind of thing, right, where we had a type function application, and in this case, it's from T2 to beta, um, where beta is new. So um, let's say beta is a new type variable again. Um, there you go, that's good. And then we're going to return this combined substitution. So we're combining all those constraints uh, into one substitution, um, and then also getting this beta out uh, using the substitution. So S3, S2, S1. Um, and then S3 on beta. That looks good. And then finally, the last thing is our let in statement. So if the expression type is let, um, then what we should do is have at S1 and tau1 is equal to calling W on the same typing environment and E1. So expert E1. And then next step is S2 and tau2 is going to be calling W. I'm going to use the same trick here where we add something to the context. So let's copy that bit. Um, so we're going to have the existing type environment plus, uh, in this case, we we'll actually want to apply substitution one first. Let's do S1 on type environment. And then we have X and it's going to be generalize of um, because that's the, the clause, uh, I think it's called uh, short for closure, but I'm not sure. Uh, we're gonna, we call it generalize in, in kind of our stuff. Um, so X has type closure over this context, uh, gamma. So that's our type end, type end, um, and tau one, right? Um, and then all of that is, you know, sent into W with E2. That's this E2 at the end here. Good. Um, and then finally, we're gonna return uh, S2 combined by S1 and tau two. Um, and that's basically our algorithm. I think we might need just a, a throw exception at the bottom. So um, an unknown expression type or something here. Uh, this should never really be called. And that's algorithm W implemented in TypeScript. So that's the kind of uh, theory version. That's the TypeScript version. Um, all this code will be, uh, or if not this specific exact code, uh, code very similar to it, uh, will be available on GitHub. Also link in description. Uh, and this should do our algorithm. So if, for example, we did, um, let's just check this still works. So we could do um, log 
pass um, what did we have? X to X, something like this. Um, I'm using these two backslashes just because it's otherwise going to uh, escape it um, from the thing. So let's have a look at that. So it can tell it's an abstraction from X to X, which is correct. And then if we do uh, W on that, and we can just have a uh, empty context to begin with, because uh, we don't need anything. Uh, what we should get here is it should be a function from anything to anything. Uh, so if we check, uh, that's what we get. So we get the, um, if we look at the return type, we get a substitution and monotype. We can kind of ignore the substitution at the end, um, but the type is uh, frustratingly not uh, shown. So I'll do the uh, dot uh, to a depth of infinity. This just like make sure it's printed all out. Um, and when we look at this, there we go. So it's a type application and it's going from T0 to T0, right? With a with type function, uh, a function type function there. Uh, so it has detected it's, you know, from something to the same thing. Uh, whereas if we did X to Y, uh, what's going to happen here is that Y is going to be undefined. So it will give a, uh, should throw an error saying that Y is undefined, right? Based on uh, this thing. So if we hit save now, uh, there we go. We get an error saying undefined variable Y. Okay, that looks like it's working. If we want to try something else, uh, like imagine we had a context. I'm just going to improve the formatting on this a little bit. Uh, so let's try that. Um, so imagine we had a context with some interesting things in it. So if we had, say, uh, uh, not has type, it's going to be a, a type application of the type function application. Um, and it's going to go from... Type type application uh, of ball, which is uh, nothing. The ball, which looks correct. Um, so this is basically us defining like what's in the standard library, what are the types in the standard library. Let's say odd is takes a um, integer and tells you whether it's odd or not, and so it returns a ball. And we can say there's some maybe some constants, so uh, true and false. Uh, I've just realised we're not we have to use lowercase because uh, our parser only supports lowercase identifiers. I also realize we never implemented uh, parentheses, but maybe we can uh, we can come back to that. Um, so our true is just going to be a bool. I so it was false, actually. Um, so false is just going to be a bool. Um, yeah. I mean, we could do numbers as well, but yeah. Oh, we'll do numbers, why not? Uh, we can say one is going to be a int or something spelt out because again, we just did a text, but we could like add add some number uh, literals pretty easily. So in this case, uh, this one is invalid. So it's giving us a fail to pass error, which is correct because we haven't written a valid Lambda expression. Um, so let's say we did not true, which should, uh, so this is, well, we could just do true, which should tell us it's a Boolean. Uh, great, so it tells us it's a Boolean. That looks right. Um, if we did um, not true, this should also be a Boolean because it just flips it from Boolean uh, to Boolean. Uh, that's cool. Uh, and similarly, if we did say um, one, this should tell us it's an integer. That looks right. Uh, and if we did uh, odd one, well, that should t tell us if this is odd, which uh, the result of which should be a Boolean. And so we should be able to see, yeah, that's a Boolean. That's all working. Um, if we did something more adventurous, let's, let's add the uh, parentheses just because I want to try. Uh, let's say we did, uh, we had an identity function and we applied that to one, which should you know just keep whatever the same type is. Um, and then we said, uh, let O equals odd in uh, odd of all of this, right? Well, what that should be doing is it should be taking one, keeping it the same. So it's still just a number and then uh, applying this function, which is then defined here, which is uh, the odd function uh, and applying it across all this. So eventually it should should return bool. So if we hit save now, it's not gonna work because it's not understanding what these brackets are doing. So it should give us a parse error. Yeah, exactly. Um, so let's go back to our uh, parser and add that. The way we're gonna add that is uh, in this kind of expression parser, what you could have is rather than any of these expressions, we could just have some parentheses. So we're gonna say uh, we can try just kind of uh, interpreting some parentheses uh, and down here, Let's say here, yeah, just because this is kind of the semi-sensible order, I think. Um, 
we can say this is a, a parentheses, uh, which can be a single parser of an expression because there should be some kind of expression inside and that's really what we are uh, returning. And uh, all that we uh, should expect inside a parentheses are left parenthesis symbol. Uh, that's like, you know, the uh, opening bracket, basically, uh, those kind of brackets. Um, then we should get uh, the actual kind of content. So again, we're going to use f.lazy on the... Um, on, on the expression because otherwise we get that infinite loop as we did for the let expressions and the abstraction expressions. Uh, and then we should expect a uh, right parentheses. There's a couple of different options of what we could do here. Uh, we could either then do like a map and then get the tuple out. Uh, but you know, as we said before, the uh, tuples don't really know the types because I think these are different types and that's why they're getting a bit confused. Um, so what we could do instead is we could just drop these uh, parentheses because we're not getting any useful information out of it. And then it should all probably know that it's, a, it's an expression. Uh, so that's cool. So we're just going to return that um, and knows there'll just be a single expression inside our parentheses. Uh, that looks all good. So if you go back, uh, I just hit save and actually it's already updated. And yeah, just as we expected, when you find like odd and all this, uh, it knows that it's a Boolean. So it looks like all our things are working. We've got our function abstraction, we've got our variables, we've got our let bindings, um, we've got our function application here. Um, we've even got our parentheses. So uh, I think that's almost everything shown off in the uh, Lambda calculus. Uh, we've generated our types. We haven't shown our, our polymorphism yet. Uh, so I guess that's with our generalized part. Uh, so the way we could show that is, for example, because it's in uh, let bindings that this generalization happens, right? It's only in this let where we have this generalize. Uh, we could do it here. So we could say let um, a classic one is saying let, let the identity function be this, because then this can be a polymorphic identity function rather than a normal one. So normally, uh, it will only take one type. So for example, it could only take the type int to int, whereas because it's polymorphic here, it will take like the type for all A, um, A to A, because we're doing that generalization uh, where it doesn't matter. Uh, so under the hood, really, this is like T0 to T0, and then this gets unified with the other parts in here, and then it says, well, T0 must be an integer. Uh, whereas in this case, it like is generalized at this point here. So we get this for all thing and then when it's used here it's instantiated and so these are just like always new type variables and so they don't like clash with the other ones uh, and that's how that kind of works under the hood so let's say we have this uh, id uh, and in this case we want to use this id function on one uh, and then also the id function on odd right where in this case id is you know int to int because it's one and in this case it's i don't know int to bool uh to interval and, and what i mean by that is like uh it's a function from interval and then it's like copying that because it's the same thing uh it's something like that uh right and so these are obviously different types and it's being used polymorphically uh because of that for all uh binding here so if we hit save we can see yeah that still works it still tells us that it's a ball uh for example there so that works really cool uh i guess the other thing we could show is uh just to prove there's not always just returning a ball we could have like an add expression in this case uh it's a function which takes a well if we think about the the add expression what re it really has is type int to int to int which is how you usually see it written and um actually this is like the bracketing i guess so you pass in one int and then you get another function where you take the other int and then you get get another int back um so if we try and implement that so we have int and then this thing this whole thing is like that inside there again um so we have int to a function of int to int. Uh, and so now when we try and use add, for example, let's say we want to add uh, one and one, um, what we're going to get is we should get a number back. So we should get int back uh, because it understands that. But if we just did add one, this is basically going to return like a plus one function. If you imagine this, what, what you're calling here, you say let uh, plus one equals add one in uh, plus one one. This plus one function just has the type into int where you give it one integer and it returns like whatever that thing is called. Maybe you could call this increment or something. Uh, but again, if you hit save now, uh, you still just get back int. Um, and in the previous example where we just had uh, plus one, for example, uh, it like can do this partially applied function where it says, oh yeah, the type you've got here is is int to int. Um, so you know, you know, we've given it these context these types in the context, uh, but in our actual program we haven't annotated it with types, and they've all just been inferred using uh, the type inference algorithm W. So that's uh, algorithm W uh, in practice, seen from basically a completely blank slate implementing the entire algorithm, uh, all the helper functions. Um, in the next video, we'll look at algorithm M briefly, uh, and then we'll wrap up, and that'll be the end of the series. Thanks for watching. Cheers.